a wayward horse carries a dying man across the lone pusta. He is not injured, he is poisoned. Morus Yokai, today on the Classic Tales Podcast. Welcome to the Classic Tales Podcast. Thank you for listening. Thank you to all of our financial supporters. We couldn't do this without you. We really try to make your support worth your while. For a $5 monthly donation, you get a monthly coupon code for $8 off any audiobook download. Give more and you get more. It kind of cracks open the website for you, so you can easily build out your classic audiobook library. And you help to give more folks like you the chance to discover the classics in a curated and easily accessible format. Go to classictalesaudiobooks.com today and become a financial supporter. You'll be glad you did. Thank you so much. I'm hoping that if we get enough supporters, I can record some more classics outside of the podcast. I'm researching out an Alexandre Dumas book that might fit the bill. If you can swing it, please chip in. In this week's story, we delve more into the Hungarian horse culture and learn more about the flatland known as the Pusta. I've been there, and it's as flat as it's described in the story. I've grown up all my life in the mountains, and that was the first time in my life I experienced the complete absence of anything varying the skyline. No mountains, no hills, just a dome of sky. It's really an amazing place. Last week, we met Sándor Deci, a Hungarian horseman, or Chikos, who was drafted into the war to serve the emperor. He gave a comb, signifying his engagement to Clary, the young woman who runs the Hortobaj Inn. Sándor wasn't too happy with her because it was evident that she had been a little unfaithful, as he had met on his way to see her, Ferko Latza, a cowboy who had received from Clary a yellow rose from the only yellow rose bush on the pusta. Due to this lover's spat, Clary remembered the teachings of a gypsy woman, who said to add mandragora root to her sweetheart's wine if she wanted to get him to love her again. Meanwhile, Ferko the cowboy was on his way to escort a herd of cattle to Austria and start a new life as the lead cowherd there. Our story today begins when the group of men are getting ready to start the journey across the Pusta to their new home and country. And now, The Yellow Rose, Part 2 of 3, by Morris Yokai. The manager of the stables thereupon thought he might have a talk with the herdsman in German. You're a fine, strong fellow, he said. I wonder they didn't make a hussar of you. Why did they not enlist you? What defect could they find? The cowboy made a wry grimace, for peasant lads do not much care for those sort of questions. I think they did not take me for a soldier, he answered, because there are two holes in my nose. There, you see, you can't talk sense, exclaimed the overseer. Clear out, you betyar, to the watering. Not there. What did I tell you? Are you tipsy? Can't you see the cows are all corralled? And who is to bring out the bull? It takes a man, and no mere stripling, to take a bull out of the herd. And this Ferko Latza was a master of the art. With sweet words and caresses, such as he might use to a pet lamb, he coaxed out the beast that belonged to Mr. Shigato and led him in front of the gentleman. A splendid animal he was, too. Massive head, sharp horns, and great black-ringed eyes. There he stood, allowing the cowboy to scratch his shaggy forehead and licking his hand with his rough, rasping tongue. And the beast has only seen the third grass, said its owner. The herdsmen reckon the age of their cattle according to the grass, that is, the summers they have lived through. Meanwhile, the painter did not let slip the opportunity of making a sketch of the great horned beast and its companion. The cowboy must stand just like that, with his hand on the horns. 
The lad, however, was not used to posing, and it injured his dignity. When their models are restless, artists often try and amuse them with conversation. Tell me, asked the painter. The others were inspecting the cows. Is it true that you herdsmen can cheat about your cattle at the market? Why, yes, the master has this very moment taken in the gentleman with the bull. He made it out to be three years old, and see, there is not an eye tooth left in its head. He opened the animal's mouth as he spoke to prove the fact of the deception. The painter's sense of honor was even keener than his passion for art. He immediately stopped painting. I have finished, he said, and hastily closing his sketchbook, he departed in search of his friends, who were standing among the chosen cattle in the enclosure. Then he revealed the great secret. The manager of the stables was horror-struck. Opening the mouths of two or three cows, he called out, Look here, overseer. You warned us that cattle sellers like to green their customers, but I won't be done like this. Every one of these cows is so old that there is not an eye-tooth left in its head. The overseer stroked his mustache and answered with a broad grin. Yes, I know that joke. It came out in last year's calendar. The general who was cheated in the Franco-Prussian War through not knowing that cattle have no eye teeth. Haven't they? asked the manager in surprise. And when the doctor assured him that it was so, he said petulantly, Well, how should I know about a cow's mouth? I am no cattle dentist. All my work has lain among horses but he must needs vent his anger on somebody, so he flew upon the painter for having led him into such a trap. How could you? he demanded. The painter, however, was too much of a gentleman to betray the cowboy, who had first taken him in. At last the Taligash put an end to the dispute by respectfully announcing that breakfast was waiting. The Taligash is cook on the pusta. All this time, he had been preparing the herdsman's breakfast of testas kasha, or meal porridge. Now, bringing out the pot, he set it on a three-legged stool. The guests sat round it, and to each he handed a long tin spoon with which to help himself. Excellent, pronounced the gentleman, and when they had eaten, the overseer and the herdsman devoured what remained. The scrapings of the pot fell to the taligash, Meanwhile, Mr. Shigato was in the kitchen, preparing the Hungarian coffee, which all who have been on the pusta know so well. Hungarian coffee is red wine heated up with brown sugar, cinnamon, and cloves. It tastes most delicious after such an early outing on the plains. Then the talagash took the pot, rinsed it, filled it with water, and hung it over the fire. The Guyash stew would be ready when the gentlemen returned from their walk. They would then taste something really good. Ferko Latza showed the company round, pointing out to the strangers all the sights of the pusta, such as the wind shelter and the railed-in burying place for cattle. In the good old days, he explained, if a beast died, we just left it where it fell, and the vultures came in flocks and picked it clean. Now, since this new order has come out, we have to inform the vet over at the Mata farm, who comes and inspects it, writes down what it died of, and bids us bury it without fail. But we are sorry to see so much good meat wasted, so we manage to take a chunk or two, which we cut up small, cook, and spread out in the sun to dry. This we stuff into our bags, and whenever we want goulash, why, we throw as many dried handfuls of meat into the pot as there are men to eat it. The painter looked the cowboy hard in the face, then turned to his master. Does this worthy herdsman of yours ever happen to speak the truth, overseer? Very rarely, but this time he has, for once in his life. Then thank you very much for your delightful guyash. Oh, don't be alarmed, said the overseer. There's nothing bad about it. Since God laid out the flat hortobaj, that has always been the custom. Look at those lads. 
Can you desire healthier or stronger fellows? Yet they have all grown up on carrion. The learned professionals may talk as much as they like. It doesn't hurt us Hungarians. The manager, however, listening to this revelation, strictly forbade his Moravian drovers to touch the dish. Though who knows, said the painter, whether the old humbug has not invented the whole story to scare us from the feast, and then have a good laugh at us. We'll see, rejoined his comrade, whether the vet eats it or not, for he must know all about it. And now came the mirage that seems like the realization of a fairy dream. Along the horizon lay a quivering sea, where high waves chased each other from east to west, the real hills standing out as little islands in their midst, and the stumpy acacias magnified into vast forests. Oxen, grazing in the distance, were transformed into a street of palaces. Boats, which appeared to cross the ocean, turned out on reaching the shore to be nothing but some far-off horses. The fantastic deception is always at its height directly after sunrise, when whole villages are often raised into the air and brought so close that, with a glass, the carts in their streets can be distinguished, their towers and houses being all mirrored upside down on the billowy fairy sea. During cloudy weather, however, they remain below the horizon. Let the Germans copy this, exclaimed Mr. Shigato to the admiring group, while the painter tore his hair in despair. Why am I compelled to see things I can't put on canvas? What is this? Why, the mirage, said the overseer. And what is the mirage? The mirage is the mirage of the Hortobaj. But Fercolazza knew more than his master. The mirage is God's miracle, he told them, sent to keep us poor herdsmen from growing weary of the long day on the pusta. Finally, the painter turned to the doctor for an explanation. I know even less, said he. I have read Flammarion's book on the atmosphere, where he speaks of the Fata Morgana as seen on the African deserts, the coasts of the Arctic Ocean, on the Orinoco, and in Sicily, also Humboldt and Bomplin's descriptions. But learned men know nothing of the Hortobaj mirage, though it may be seen every hot summer's day from sunrise to sundown. Thus are Hungary's wonderful natural phenomena utterly ignored by the scientific world. It did the doctor good to pour out the bitterness of his heart before the strangers, but he had no time to admire the marvels of nature being obliged to hurry back to his animal hospital and pharmacy at Mata. So, bidding adieu to both his old and new friends, he jumped into his gig and jogged away over the plain. The herd was already scattered far out on the pusta, the cowboys driving it forward. The grass near at hand is more luscious, but in spring the cattle graze far afield, so that when summer scorches the distant pastures, the nearer still remained for them. Very touching was the farewell between the main herd and their companions in the enclosure, like a chorus of druids and Valkyrie. The head of the stables had meanwhile been occupied with the financial side of the business and in arranging the line of march. In crisp, brand-new hundred florin notes he paid Mr. Shigato, who stuffed them into his pockets so carelessly that the manager thought it not superfluous to remind him to look after his money on the pusta. Whereupon the proud citizen of Debrecen answered phlegmatically, Sir, I have been plundered and deceived during the course of my existence, but never by robbers or rogues. They were always honorable gentlemen who knew how to thieve and cheat. The overseer likewise received his fee. If, said the old herdsman, I might, out of pure friendliness, give you a word of advice, I would recommend you, as you have bought the cows, to take the calves as well. What? We don't want a crowd of noisy brutes. Why should we take carts for them? They will go on their own feet. Yes, and hinder us at every step 
by stopping the cows to drink. Besides, the duke's chief reason for buying this herd is, as I know, not to experiment with pure Hungarian cattle, but to cross them with his Spanish breed. Of course, that is quite another thing, said the overseer. There now remained nothing else to do but to start the new bought herd. The manager gave the herdsman his credentials, and the chief constable handed him his pass. These documents, together with the cattle certificates, he put into his bag. Then he tied the bell round the bull's neck, knotted his cloak round its horns, and bidding everyone good day, sprang into the saddle. The overseer brought him his knapsack, filled with bacon, bread, and garlic, enough for the week that they would take to reach Mishgolts. Then he described the whole route to him, how they must first go by Polgar because of the mud at Chega, caused by the spring rains, and sleep on the way in the little wood. They would cross the Thais by the ferry boat, but should the water be high, it would be better to wait there and give hay to the beasts rather than risk an accident. Then he impressed on his godson the necessity of so behaving in a foreign country that Debretsen need never blush for him. He must obey his employers, hold his high spirits in check, never forget Hungarian, nor abandon his faith, but keep all the church feasts and not squander his earnings. If he married, he must take care of his wife and give his children Hungarian names. When he had time, he might write a line to his godfather, who would willingly pay the postage. Then, with the godfather's blessing, he left the young fellow to set out on his journey. Now the two Moravian drovers had undertaken the task of driving the herd, when free from the enclosure, in the desired direction. But naturally the beasts, as soon as they were set at liberty, rushed about on all sides, and when the drovers attempted to force them, turned and prepared to run at them. Then they again made for the corral and their calves. Go and help those poor Christians, said the overseer to the herdsman. Better crack the whip among them, suggested the painter. The devil take your whip, growled the overseer. Do you want them to run to the four ends of the earth? These are no horses. I said they ought to be tied together in pairs by their horns, cried the manager. All right, just leave it to me. With that, the cowherd whistled, and a little sheepdog jumped from the karam, and barking loudly, scampered after the disordered herd, dashed round the scattered animals, snapped at the heels of the lazy ones, and in less than two minutes had brought the whole drove into a well-ordered military file, marching behind the bull with the bell. Then the cowherd also bounded after them, crying, Hey, Rosa! Chaco! Kesha? He knew the name of every one of the twenty-four, and they obeyed. As for the bull, it was called Buska, Proud One. Thus, under this leadership, the herd moved quietly off over the wide plain. For long the gentleman gazed after it, till it arrived at the brink of the quivering fairy sea. Then suddenly, each beast grew gigantic, more like a mammoth than a cow jet black in color, and with legs growing to a fearful length, until at last there appeared to be attached to them a second cow, moving along with the other, only upside down. Herdsmen, dog, drovers, all followed them head downwards. The painter sank back on the grass, his arms and legs extended. Well, if I tell this at the art club in Vienna, they will kick me out at the door. A bad sign said Mr. Shigato, shaking his head. It's well the money is in my pocket. Yes, the cattle are not home yet, muttered the overseer. What I wonder at, observed the manager, is why some enterprising individual has not taken the whole show on lease. Ah, said Mr. Shigato, with proud stolidity. No doubt they would take it to Vienna if they could, but Debretsen won't give it up. Chapter 4 The veterinary and his gig jolted merrily over the pusta. 
his good little horse knew its lesson by heart and needed neither whip nor bridle. So the doctor could take out his notebook, reckon, and scribble. All at once, looking up, he noticed a Chikosh approaching, his horse galloping wildly. The pace was so mad that both rider and steed seemed to be out of their minds. Suddenly the horse rushed towards him, stood still, reared, and then swerved aside, taking another direction. Its rider sat with head thrown back and arched body, clutching the bridle in both hands, while the horse shook itself and began to neigh and snort in a frightened manner. Seeing this, the doctor seized whip and reins and made every endeavor to overtake the horseman. As he got closer, he recognized the Chikosh. Shandor Dechi, he exclaimed. And the rider appeared to know him also, and to slacken the bridle as if to allow the horse to go nearer. The clever animal reached the doctor's gig, puffing and blowing, and there stopped of its own accord. It shook its head, snorted, and in fact did everything but speak. The lad sat in the saddle, bent backwards, his face staring at the sky. The bridle had dropped from his fingers, but his legs still gripped the sides of his horse. Shandor, lad! Shandor Dechi! called the doctor. But the boy seemed not to hear him, or hearing, to be incapable of speech. Jumping from his trap, the doctor went up to the rider, caught him round the waist, and lifted him out of the saddle. What ails you? he said. But the lad was silent. His mouth was shut, his neck bent back, and his breath came in quick gasps. His eyes, wide open, had a ghastly gleam, which the dilation of the pupils rendered all the more hideous. Laying him flat on the turf, the doctor began to examine him. Pulse irregular, sometimes quick, sometimes stopping completely, pupils widely dilated, jaws tightly closed, back curved. This young fellow has been poisoned, he cried, and with some vegetable poison, too. The doctor had found the Chikosh midway between the Hortobaj Inn and the little settlement at Mata. Probably he was on his way to the hamlet when the poison first began to act, and had tried as long as consciousness lasted to get there. But when the spasms seized him, his movements became involuntary, and the convulsive twitching of his arms had startled the horse. It was also foaming at the mouth. The doctor next attempted to lift him into the gig, but the lad was too heavy, and he could not manage it. Still, to leave him on the pusta was impossible. Before he could return with help, the eagles would already be there, tearing at the unfortunate man. All this time the horse looked on intelligently, as if it would speak, and now bending its head over its master, it gave some short, abrupt snorts. Well, help me then, said the doctor. Why should he not understand, a pusta steed, who has three quarters of a soul at least? Seeing the doctor struggling with his master, it caught hold of his waistcoat with his teeth and raised him, and so between them they managed to get the chikosh into the gig. Then the doctor knotted the horse's halter to the back of the trap and galloped on to the settlement. There, it is true, were hospital and pharmacy, but only for animals. The doctor himself was but a cattle doctor. In such cases, however, he may help who can. The question was, could he? The first thing to do was to discover what poison was at work, strychnine or belladonna. At all events, black coffee could do no harm. Arrived at the farm, the doctor called out his assistant and his housekeeper. Coffee was ready, but aid was necessary before the patient could swallow. His jaws were so tightly locked that they had to force his teeth apart with a chisel before it could be poured down. Ice on his head, a mustard plaster on his stomach, ordered the doctor. And there being no spare person at hand, he carried out his own directions, at the same time giving instructions to his assistant and writing a letter at the table. Listen, he said and think of what I am telling you. Hurry in the gig to the Hortobaj Inn, and hand this letter to the innkeeper. If he is not at home, then tell the coachman my orders are to put the horses in the calèche, and go as fast as he possibly can to town, and give this sealed letter to the head doctor there. He must wait and bring him back, 
I am a veterinary surgeon, and on oath not to practice on beasts with souls. The case needs help urgently, and the doctor will bring his own medicine. But ask the innkeeper's daughter for every grain of coffee she may have in the house, for that the patient must drink until the real doctor comes. Now see how sharp you can be. The assistant understood the task imposed on him, and made all haste to get under way. The poor little Gray had hardly had breathing time before it was rattling back to the inn. Clary happened to be on the veranda, watering her musk geraniums, when the gig drove up. What brings you, Peshta? she asked, in such a fearful hurry. A letter for the master. Well, it will be difficult to get a word out of him, because he is just putting a new swarm into the hive. But it is an order from the vet, said Peshta, to send the carriage to town immediately for the best doctor. The doctor? Is someone ill? Who has the ague now? None of us, for the doctor picked him up on the meadow. It is Shandor Dechi, the Chikosh. The girl gave a cry, and the watering can fell from her hands. Shandor? Shandor is ill? So ill that he is trying to climb up the wall and bite the bedclothes in his agony. Somebody has poisoned him. The girl had to clutch the door with both hands to prevent herself falling. Our doctor is not sure what is killing the herdsman, so he is obliged to summon the town doctor to inspect him. Then Clary muttered something, but what could not be heard. See, leave go the door, miss, said the assistant, and let me in to look for the master. Doesn't he know what has hurt him? stammered the girl. And the doctor's message to you, added Peshta, is to collect all the ground coffee in the house and give it to me. Till the other doctor comes with medicine, he is treating Shandor Dechi with coffee, for he can't tell what poison they gave the poor fellow. Then he hurried off to search for the innkeeper. He can't tell what poison, murmured Clary to herself, but I can. If that be the danger, why, I could tell the doctor, and then he would at once know what to give him. She ran into her room, and opening the chest, took from its bottom the man-shaped witch roots. These she stuffed into her pocket. Cursed be she who had given the evil counsel, and cursed be she who had followed it. Then she set to work grinding coffee, so that by the time the assistant returned from the garden, where he had been forced to help with the swarm, the tin box was quite full. Now give me the coffee, miss, said he. I am coming with you. The assistant was a sharp lad and saw through the sieve. Do not come, miss, he said. You really must not see Shandor Dechi in such a state. It is enough to freeze one's marrow to look at his agony. Besides, the doctor would never allow it. It is just the doctor I want to speak to, said the girl. But then who will attend to the customers? The servant girl is here, and the lad, they'll manage. But at least ask the master's permission, begged Peshta. Not I, cried Clary. He would not let me go. There, get out of the way. So saying, she pushed the assistant aside, flew out into the courtyard, and with one bound was seated in the gig. There she seized the reins, flourished the whip about the poor gray's back, and drove where she wished. The assistant, left behind gasping, shouted after her, Miss Clary, Miss Clary, stop a bit! But though he ran till he was breathless, he only caught the gig at the bridge, where the tired horse had to go slowly up the incline. Then he too jumped onto the seat. Never had the gray's back felt such thwacks as on this drive to Mata. By the time they reached the sandy ground, they could only go at a walk, and the girl, impatient, sprang from the gig, and catching hold of the canister, rushed over the clover field to the doctor's farm, which she reached panting and speechless. Through the window, the doctor saw her coming and went to meet her, barring her way at the veranda. You come here, Clarica? How is that? Shandor? gasped the girl. Shandor is ill. Through the open door, the girl could hear the groans of the sick man. What has happened to him? I don't know myself, and I don't want to accuse anyone. But I know, cried the girl. Someone, a wicked girl, gave him something bad to drink. I know who it was, too. She stirred it into his wine to make him love her, and that made him ill. I know who it was and how it was. 
Miss Clary, do not play the traitor. This is a serious crime and must be proved. Here are the proofs. And with that, the girl took the roots out of her pocket and laid them before the doctor. Oh, cried the doctor, stupefied. Why, this is a tropa mandragora, a deadly poison. The girl clapped her hands to her face. How did I know it was poison? she asked. Clarica, said the doctor, do not startle me more, or I shall jump out of the window. Surely you did not poison Shandor? The girl nodded, mutely. And what in thunder did you do it for? He was so unkind to me, and once a gypsy woman made me believe that if I steeped that root in his wine, I should have him at my feet again. Well, I never. You must hold traffic with gypsy woman, must you? To school you won't go, where the master would teach you to distinguish poisonous plants. No, no, you will only learn from a gypsy vagabond. Well, you have made your lad nice and obedient. Will he die? asked the girl with an imploring look. Die? Must he die next? No, his body and soul are not stitched together in such a ramshackle fashion. Then he will live? cried the girl and knelt down before the doctor, snatching his hands and kissing them repeatedly. Don't kiss my hand, said he. It is all over mustard plaster, and will make your mouth swell. So she kissed his feet, and when he forbade that, also his footprints. Down on the brick floor she went and kissed the muddy footprints with her pretty rosy lips. Now stand up and talk sense, said the doctor. Have you brought the coffee, ground and roasted? Right for that is what he must drink till the doctor comes. It is well you told me what poison the lad took, for now I know the antidote. But as for you, child, make up your mind to vanish from these parts as soon as you like, for what you have done is a crime, which the town doctor will report, and the matter will come before the court and judge, so fly away, where there are no tongues to tell on you. I won't fly, said the girl, drying her tears with her apron. Here is my neck. More I can't offer. If I have done wrong, it is only just that I should suffer for it. But from this spot I won't stir. The groaning I hear through the door binds me faster than if my feet were in fetters. Doctor, sir, for God's sake, let me be near to nurse him, to foment his head, smooth his pillows, and wipe the sweat from his brow. Indeed? Is that your idea? Why, they would clap me into the madhouse if I entrusted the nursing of the victim to the poisoner. A look of unspeakable pain came over the girl's face. Does the doctor believe that I am really bad then? She asked. Glancing round, she caught sight of the damnatory root lying on the window sill, and before he could stop her, had grasped it and was putting it into her mouth. No, no, Clarica, said the doctor. Do not play with that poison. Don't bite it. Take it out of your mouth instantly. I would rather allow you to go to the patient, though it is no sight for you, as I tell you beforehand. No tender-hearted person should see such suffering. I know. Your assistant told me everything. How one cannot recognize him. His face is so changed. Dark blotches instead of healthy red color. Death-like shadow on his forehead and cold perspiration shining on his cheeks. His eyes are wide open with a glassy stare, his lips seem gummed together, and if he opens them, they foam. How he groans, struggles, gnashes his teeth, tosses his arms about, and contorts his back, an agonizing sight. But let this be my punishment, to feel his moans and sufferings like so many sharp knives stabbing my heart and if I do not actually witness them with my own eyes and ears, I shall still seem to see and hear them as acutely as if I was really present. Well, said the doctor, let us see if you are really brave enough. Take charge of the coffee pot and have black coffee always ready. But if you burst out crying, I will push you out of the room. Then he opened the door and allowed her to enter. The world went blue and green to the girl, as her eyes fell on her sweetheart lying there. Where was the radiant young fellow who had left her such a short time ago? Now it was painful to look at him, 
to endure the sight of him. The doctor called in his assistant, and the girl stifled her sobs as best she might over the coffee pot. If the doctor caught the sound of one, he would glance at her reproachfully, and she would pretend it was a cough. The two men applied mustard plasters to the patient's feet. Now bring your coffee and pour it into his mouth, said the doctor. But that was a business. Both had to exert their full strength to hold down the lad's arms and prevent his flinging them about. Now, Clarica, open his mouth. Not like that. You must force his teeth apart with the chisel. Don't be afraid. He won't swallow it. See? He holds it as fast as a vice. The girl obeyed. Now pour in the coffee by the spout, gently. There, you are a clever girl. I can recommend you to the Sisters of Mercy as a sick nurse. There was a smile on the girl's face, but her heart was breaking. If only he would not look at me with those eyes. Yes, said the doctor. That is the worst of all. Those two staring eyes. I think so, too. At length there seemed some little improvement possibly the effect of the remedy. The patient's groans became less frequent, and the cramp in his limbs relaxed, but his forehead burned like fire. The doctor instructed the girl how to wring out the cold water bandage, laying it on the aching head, leave it a little, and then change it again. She did all that he bade her. Now I see that you have a brave heart, he said, and in time came her reward, for to her joy, the sufferer suddenly closed his eyelids, and the terrible stare of those black-shadowed eyes ceased altogether. Later, his mouth relaxed, and they were able to open the close-shut jaws without difficulty. Maybe it was the prompt application of the antidote. Maybe the dose of poison had not been strong. But by the time the doctor from town had arrived, the patient was very unmistakably better. The veterinary and the doctor conversed in Latin, which the girl could not understand, but her instinct told her that it was of her they were speaking. Then the doctor ordered this and that, and after writing the Usum Repertum, returned to his carriage and hastened back to town. Not so the gendarme whom he had brought with him on the box. He remained. Hardly had the physician gone when another trap rumbled into the yard. This was the Hortobaj innkeeper, who had come to demand his daughter. Gently now, master, they said. The young woman is under arrest. Don't you see the gendarme? I always did say that when once a girl loses her head, she goes mad altogether. Well, it's no concern of mine. And with charming indifference, the old innkeeper thereupon turned and drove back to the Hortobaj Inn. Chapter 5 All night long the girl watched beside him. To no one would she yield her place at the sickbed. She had been up till dawn the night before as well, but how differently occupied. This was her penance. Now and then she nodded sleepily in her chair, but the slightest moan from the sick man sufficed to wake her. Sometimes she renewed the cold bandage on his head and bathed her own eyes to keep herself awake. At the first cock crow, kindly sleep settled softly on the patient. He stretched himself out and began to snore with beautiful regularity. At first the girl was terrified and thought the death struggle was at hand but presently she grew very happy. This was a good, honest snore, such as could only emanate from healthy lungs, and besides, as she reflected, it kept her wide awake. When the cock crew for the second time, he was in a sound slumber. Then he started from sleep and yawned widely. Thank heaven he could yawn again. The spasms had quite ceased and all who suffer from their nerves know the worth of a good yawn after the attack. It is as good as a lottery prize. The girl wished to give him more coffee, but the man shook his head. Water, he murmured. So she rapped through to the doctor, who was reposing in the next room, 
to know if she might give the patient water as he was asking for it. The doctor rose and came out in dressing gown and slippers to see for himself. He was most satisfied. He is going on well. To be thirsty is a good sign. Give him as much water as he wants. The invalid drank a whole carafe and then dropped into a quiet slumber. Now he is fast asleep, said the doctor to Clary. So you may go and lie down on the bed in the housekeeper's room. I will leave my door open and take care of him. But the girl pleaded so hard to be allowed to stay, to lean her head on the table and thus steal a nap, that he at last let her do as she pleased. Suddenly she awoke with a start to find it was day, and the sparrows were twittering at the windows. The patient was then dreaming as well as sleeping. His lips moved. He murmured something and laughed. His eyes half opened, but evidently with a great effort, for they closed immediately. But his parched lips seemed to be asking for something. Shall I give you water? whispered the girl. Yes, he muttered with his eyes shut. So she brought him the water bottle, but he had not strength enough in his arms, this great fellow, even to raise the tumbler to his mouth. She had to lift his head and give it to him. Even while drinking, he fell half asleep. Hardly had his head touched the pillow when he began to hum aloud, probably a continuation of the gay air of his dreams. Why not love this world of ours? Gypsy maid, Madhyar maid, both are flowers. Chapter 6 A day or two later, the lad was on his feet again. Such tough fellows as he, born and bred on the pusta, do not linger long on the sick list when once the crisis is past. They abhor bed. So on the third day, he told the doctor that he wished to get back to the horses at his place of service. Wait a bit, Shandor, my boy. Somebody has to speak with you first. Somebody turned out to be the examining magistrate. On the third day, after the report, this official with his notary and a gendarme arrived at Mata to conduct the formal inquiry. The accused, the young woman, had already been examined and had given a full account of everything. She denied nothing, only saying in her defense that she was very much in love with Shandor and wished to make him love her as well. All this was taken down in the protocol and signed. Nothing now remained but to confront the prisoner with her victim, and this was done as soon as the herdsman had regained sufficient strength. Meanwhile, he never once uttered the girl's name in the doctor's presence, pretending not to know that she had been in the house nursing him. And as the young man recovered consciousness, she ceased to show herself at all. Before confronting her with him, the magistrate read out the deposition to the girl, who confirmed it anew and would not have a word altered. Then Shandor Dechi was brought forward. As soon as the Chikosh entered the room, he began to act a preconcerted role. His swaggering Betyar airs were such that one would have thought he had only learned to play the Chikosh on the stage. When the judge asked his name, he stared at him over his shoulder. My worthy name? Shandor Dechi. I have hurt no one, nor have I stolen anything, that I should be dragged here by gendarmes. Besides, I am not under civil authority. I am still a soldier of the emperor. And if anyone has a complaint against me, let him go before the regimental authorities, and there I will answer him. The magistrate silenced him. Gently, young man, no one is accusing you of anything. We only want enlightenment in an affair closely concerning yourself. That is the object of this investigation. Tell us when you were last in the tap room of the Hortobaj Inn. I can inform you exactly. What is there to hide? But first send away this gendarme at my back, because if he should happen to come too near, I am touchy, and might give him a blow. Now, now, not so fast, young fellow. The gendarme is not guarding you. 
Tell us when it was that you visited Miss Clary here, the day she served you with wine. Well, I will, as soon as I have got my wits together. The last time I was at the Hortobaj Inn was last year, on Demeter's Day, when they engaged the shepherds. Then they took me for a soldier, and I have not been in the place since. Shandor, broke in the girl. Yes, Shandor is my name, so they christened me. Then you were not there three days ago, when the barmaid gave you the wine mixed with mandragora, which made you so ill? I never was at the Hortobaj Inn nor did I see Miss Clary. It is half a year since I asked for any of her wine. Shandor, you are lying for my sake, cried the girl. The judge grew angry. Do not try to mislead the authorities with your denials. The girl has already confessed everything, that she made you drink wine poisoned with mandrake roots. Why then? The young woman lied, said the herdsman but what reason could she have for accusing herself of a crime which entails such heavy punishment? Why? What reason? Because when the mad fit comes upon a girl, she simply raves without rhyme or reason. Miss Clary fancies our eyes don't meet each other's often enough. So she has an ill will against me, and now she takes to accusing herself to compel me to let out the other one's name, out of sheer compassion the pretty lass to whom I went to lose my soul and cure my heart, and who gave me the charm to drink. Well, if I choose, I'll tell, but if I don't, I won't. This is Miss Clary's revenge, for my having neither called on her nor gone near her since I came home on leave. At these words the girl turned on him like a fury. Shandor, you, who have never lied in your life, what ails you? when the one little lie which they put in your mouth would have saved you from soldiering that you could not tell. Now you deny being with me three days ago? Then who brought me the comb that I have done up my hair with? The Chikosh laughed grimly. Who brought it, and why? Surely the young lady knows better than I. Shandor, this is not right of you. I don't mind if they put me in the pillory for my wrongdoing and lash and scourge me. Here is my head. Let them cut it off if they like. But don't tell me you never cared for me, nor came to see me, for that is worse than death. The judge flew into a rage. Confound you, he cried. Settle your love affairs between yourselves. Since a flagrant case of poisoning has been committed, I want to know who was the culprit. Now answer exclaimed the girl with flaming cheeks. Answer that. Well, well, since I must, so be it. I can tell you all about it. On the Ohat Pusta, I fell in with a gypsy band in tents. One of them, a lovely girl, with eyes like slows, who was standing outside, spoke to me and invited me in. They were roasting a sucking pig, and we enjoyed ourselves. I drank their wine and at once felt that it had a bitter taste. But the kisses of the gypsy lass were so sweet that I forgot all about it. You lie, lie, lie! shrieked the girl. You have invented that story this very minute! The herdsman laughed loudly, clapped one hand to the crown of his head, snapped his fingers in the air, and started his favorite song. Why not love this world of ours? Gypsy maid... Madhya made, both are flowers. Not this very minute had he invented this tale, but on that night of pain, when the yellow rose had sat smoothing his pillows and bathing his brow. Then, with his aching head, he had thought out a plan to save his faithless sweetheart. The judge struck his fist on the table, None of your nonsense before me, making fun of the matter. I make fun of the matter, exclaimed the Chikosh, becoming serious instantly. I swear before God above, all I have said is true. He raised his three fingers, and the girl screamed out, No, no, do not perjure yourself, do not risk the salvation of your soul. The devil take you both, for you are both mad. This was the judge's verdict. 
Notary, take down the herdsman's statement regarding the gypsy, who will be charged with committing the crime. As to her whereabouts, that the police must discover. It is their business. You two can go. If necessary, we will summon you again. Then they let the girl free. She deserved a little fatherly rebuke, and that she got. The lad remained behind to hear his deposition taken down and to sign it. The girl waited on the veranda for him to come out, his horse being tethered to an acacia hard by. The lad, however, first went to the doctor to thank him for his unremitting kindness. The doctor, having attended the inquiry, had, of course, heard everything. Well, Shandor, he said, as soon as the thanks had been got over. I have seen many famous actors on the stage, but never one who played the betyar as you did. I did right, didn't I? asked the lad gravely. Yes, indeed, you are an honorable fellow. But say a kind word to the girl if you meet her. Poor thing, she never meant to do such wrong. I am not angry with her. May God bless you, sir, for your great goodness. As he stepped out onto the veranda, the girl stopped him and seized his hand. Shandor, what have you done? Sent your soul to perdition? Sworn falsely? Told a lying tale, all to set me free? You have denied ever having loved me, that my body may escape the lash, that my slender neck the blow that would sever it. Why have you done this? That is my affair. This much I will tell you. From henceforth... One of us, too, I must hate and despise. Do not cry. You are not that one. I dare no longer look in your eyes, because I see myself reflected there. And I am worth no more than the broken button that is coming off my waistcoat. God bless you. With that, he untied his horse from the acacia, sprang onto it, and dashed off into the pusta. The girl gazed and gazed after him, till her sight grew dim from tears. Then she sought till she found the broken button he had cast on the floor. This she placed next her heart. Chapter 7 It happened just as the overseer had predicted. When the herd reached the Polgar Ferry, it was impossible to cross. The Tais, the Shayo, the Hernad, all were in flood. The water touched the planking of the footbridge. The ferryboat had been hauled up and moored to the willows on the bank. Great trees, torn up by their roots, were coming down on the turbulent, dirty flood, and flocks of wild ducks, divers, and cormorants were disporting themselves on the waters fearless of the gun at such a time. But that communication should be stopped was a dire misfortune, not only for the duke's cattle, but much more so for all the market-goers from Debrecen and Uivaros, striving to reach the Onod Fair. There stood their carts, out among the puddles, under the open sky, while their owners bewailed the bad luck in the one small drinking-room of the Polgar Ferry House. Ferko Latsa went off to buy hay for the herd and purchased a whole stack, for here we can sit kicking our heels for three days at the shortest. Now, by good luck, there was, among those bound for the market, a purveyor of cooked meat with her enormous iron frying pan and fresh pork, ready sliced. She found a ready sale for her wares, setting up a makeshift cook shop in a hut constructed of maize stalks. Firewood she did not need to buy. The taste brought plenty. Wine the old innkeeper had, sharp but good, since none better was to be got. Besides, every Hungarian carries his pipe, tobacco, and his bag of provisions when he gives his mind to travel. So the time passed in forming new acquaintances. The Debrecen bootmaker and the tanner from Balmaz Uivaros were old friends while the vendor of cloaks was universally addressed as Daddy. The gingerbread maker, who thought himself better than the others because he wore a long coat with a scarlet collar, 
sat at a separate table, but nevertheless joined in the conversation. Later, a horse cooper appeared, but as his nose was crooked, he was only allowed to talk standing. When the cowherd entered, a place was squeezed out for him at the table, for even townsfolk respect a herdsman's position of trust. The Moravian drovers stayed outside to watch the cattle. The tittle-tattle went on pleasantly and quietly as yet, young Mistress Pundor not having arrived. When she put in an appearance, nobody would get in a word edgeways. But her cart had evidently stuck on the way, at some seductive inn, she having seized the opportunity of travelling with the carpenter, her brother-in-law. He was taking tulip-decorated chests to the Onod Fair, while young Mistress Pundor supplied the world with soap and tallow candles. When the herdsman entered, the room was so full of smoke that he could hardly see. Then tell us, Daddy, the shoemaker was saying to the tanner, for you at Uivaro are nearer the Hortobaj Inn than we. How did the innkeeper's girl poison the Chikosh? At these words, the cowboy felt as if he had been shot through the heart. How was it? Well, pretty little clerica there peppered the stew she was making him with crow's claws. I know otherwise, interrupted the gingerbread baker. Little Clary put datura in the honey mead, the stuff they use for stupefying fish. Well, of course, the gentleman must know best, for he has a gold watch chain. They sent for the regimental surgeon from Uivaros to dissect the deceased Chicos, and he found the claws in his inside. They put them in spirits to be produced as evidence at the trial. So you have killed the poor fellow. We didn't hear he died from poison, only went mad and was sent up to Buddha to have a hole bored in his head, for all the strength of the poison had gone there. Sent him up to Buddha, did they? Sent him underground, you mean? My wife herself spoke to the very maker of imitation flowers who made those strewn over Dechi's shroud. That is a fact. Now, now, Mistress Cheekmark is here with her fried meat, and as she came a day later from Debretzin, she must know the truth. Let us call her in. But Mistress Cheekmark, being unable to leave her frizzling pan, could only give her opinion through the window. She likewise buried the poison Chikosh. The Debretzin clerk had chanted over his grave, and the priest had preached a farewell sermon. And what happened to the girl? inquired three voices at once. The girl? She ran off with her lover, a cowboy, by whose advice she poisoned the Chikosh. They are setting up a robber band together. Ferkolatsa listened quietly to all this. Stuff and nonsense, bosh, exclaimed the gingerbread baker, capping her version. I'm afraid you've not heard right, dear Mistress Cheekmark. They caught the girl directly, put her in irons, and brought her in between gendarmes. My lad was there when they took her to the townhouse. Still the cowherd listened without stirring. Suddenly, amid great commotion, arrived the above-mentioned laggard, young Mistress Pundor, she foremost, then the driver, lastly the brother-in-law, dragging a large chest. How polite a language is Hungarian! Even an individual like the soap-making lady has her title of respect, if Yasoin, or young mistress. Now Mistress Pundor will tell us what happened to the girl at the inn who poisoned the Chikosh, cried everyone. Yes, of course, dear soul, just let me get my breath a bit. With that, she sat down on the large chest. A chair or bench would have smashed to atoms under her form. Did they catch pretty Clary, or has she run away? Oh, my dears, why, they have tried her already. Condemned to death she is. Tomorrow they put her in the convict cell, and the execution is the day after. The headsman comes today from Seged, and they have taken a room for him at the White Horse because the folks at the Bull refused him. "'Tis as true as I'm sitting here. "'I have it from the porter himself, "'who comes to me for candles. "'And what sort of death is she to have? "'Well, under the old rule, "'and richly she deserves it, "'they would set her on straw and burn her. "'But seeing she is of the better class, "'and her father of good family, "'they will only cut off her head. "'They generally behead gentlefolk. 
I'll quit that, mistress, contradicted the gingerbread man. Do they heed such things nowadays? Not a bit of it. Why, before forty-eight, if I put on my mantle with the silver buttons, they took me for a gentleman and never asked me for toll on the bridge at Pesht. But now I may wear my mantle. I'll drop your mantle with the silver buttons, said the cloth merchant, taking the word out of his mouth. Let the young mistress here tell us what she has heard. What object could the pretty lass have for contriving such a murder? Ah, tis a very strange business. One murder leads to another. A while ago, a rich Moravian cattle dealer came here buying cattle. He had much money. Pretty Clary there talked it over with her lover, the cowherd, and together they murdered the dealer and threw him into the hortobage. But the horse herd, who was also sweet on the girl, caught them at it. And so first they divided the stolen money between them, and then poisoned the chikosh to put him out of the way. And what about the cowherd then? Has he been caught? inquired the bootmaker excitedly. They would if they could, but he has vanished utterly. Gendarmes are searching the whole pusta for him, and a price is set on his head. They have stuck up his description, as I have read for myself, a hundred dollars to whoever catches him alive. I know him well enough, too. Now, had Shandor Deci been sitting there instead of Ferko Latza, great would have been the scene, for here was the moment for a real effective bit of drama, to fling his loaded cudgel on the table, knock the chair from under him and shout out, I am the herdsman on whose head they have set a price. Which of you wants the hundred dollars? then the whole worthy company would have taken to their heels and fled, some to the cellar, some up the chimney. But the cowboy was of a different temperament, and had been used all his life to act with care and caution. Besides, his work among the cattle had impressed upon him the imprudence of catching the bull by the horns. So leaning his elbows on the table, he asked calmly, would you then recognize the herdsman from the description, mistress? Why not indeed? How could I help knowing him? He has bought my soap often enough to be sure. But dear me, ma'am, said the horse cooper, who desired to display his knowledge, what use can a herdsman have for soap? Surely all cowboys wear blue shirts and breeches, which never need washing, because the linen has been first boiled in lard. Deary me, sakes alive, did you ever? So soap is only wanted for dirty clothes, is it? A cowboy never shaves, does he? Perhaps he always wears as long a beard as a Jew horse cooper. Everyone shrieked with laughter, much to the discomfiture of the snubbed intruder. Now need I have exposed myself to that? Grumbled the unhappy man. You don't happen to know the name, continued the herdsman in a quiet voice. Of that cowboy, mistress? Not know his name. It is but just slipped out of my mind. It is on the tip of my tongue, for I know him as well as my own child. Is it Ferko Latza? Yes, yes, that's it. Why, well, you've taken it out of my mouth. Perhaps you know him yourself. But the herdsman refrained from announcing that he knew him as well as his father's only son. Quietly knocking out the ashes from his pipe, he refilled it, rose, and propped up his cudgel against the straw-bottomed chair to show it was engaged and no one else might occupy it. Then, relighting his pipe at the solitary candle burning on the middle of the table, he left the room. Those remaining made remarks about him. Surely something heavy as lead is weighing on that man. I don't like the look of his eyes. Could he know aught about the Chikosh's murder, think you? Again the horse-dealer committed the offense of meddling in the discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, he said, permit me to make the humble observation that yesterday, when I was on the Ohat Pusta, buying horses, I saw there the murdered and poisoned Shandor Deci looking as fresh and blooming as a rosy apple. He lassoed the colts for me. This is as true as I live. What? And you let us sit here telling lies to one another? stormed the whole assembly. Here, clear out, get away. No sooner said than done, they seized him by the collar and flung him out of the room. The chucked-out traveler 
smoothing his crumpled hat, spluttered and swore, till he found a moral to fit the case. Now need I have exposed myself to that? What is the good of a Jew speaking the truth? Meanwhile, the cowherd going to the cattle proposed to the Moravian drovers that they should go inside for a change and drink a glass of wine. He would watch the cows. The chair with the stick beside it was his. While he watched, he picked up a bit of poor man's peat, stuffing it up his coat sleeve. What could he want with it? Chapter 8 Lucky it is that no one outside the Hortobaj knows about this poor man's peat, which is gathered on the meadowland. One thing is certain. It is no lily of the valley. It is the sole fuel of the Pusta herdsman. In fact, a sort of zoological peat. We remember the tale of the Hungarian landowner who, finding it advisable to go abroad after the revolution, chose free Switzerland as a temporary place of residence. But his eyes never grew used to the high mountains. Every evening, on withdrawing to his room, he would take a piece of peat found on the pasture, and laying it on the hearth, kindle it. Then, as he sat with closed eyes in the smell of the smoke, he would once more fancy himself back on the wide, wide plains, among the moving herds and tinkling cowbells, and all the rest for which his soul longed. Well, if this peat smoke can exert such a strong influence on an educated mind, how were it possible to doubt the following story? The travelers had to wait two more days at the Polgar Ferry. On the third, about midnight, the ferryman brought the glad tidings to the expectant crowd, whose patience and provisions were alike exhausted that the taste had fallen greatly. The ferry boat had been replaced, and by morning they would be able to cross. Those with carts lost no time in running them on board and arranging them side by side. Next they took the horses. Then came the turn for the cattle. Room was made for them with difficulty. The crush was great, but mild after all to what theater-goers usually endure. Last of all, the bull, the terror of every one, was brought. And now no one remained but the herdsman and his horse. The two Moravian drovers took their places between the cows and the carts. But as yet no start could be made. The tow rope was strained taut by the water, and they were obliged to wait till the sunshine could relax it somewhat. Moisture was rising like steam all along its surface. So the cowherd, wishing to utilize the time, suggested that the ferryman might cook them a paprikash of fish. Nothing else eatable was to be had, but a pot was at hand, likewise plenty of fish, left by the receding waters. The boatman caught them by sticking an oar under their gills, fat carp, silurius, and sturgeon. These they hastily cleaned, cut up, and cast into the pot, underneath which a little fire was kindled. Now all was ready, when the question rose, Who has paprika? Every ordinary, self-respecting Hungarian carries his own supply in his knapsack. But after three days' famine, even paprika will give out. Nevertheless, no paprika, no fish stew. I have some, said the cowboy, and pulled a wooden box from his sleeve. Everyone noted what a far-seeing man he must be to reserve his own paprika for the last extremity, and henceforth regarded him as the savior of the party. The stew pot was in the end of the ferry boat, and to reach it the herdsman traversed its whole length, the cattle being stationed about the middle. But then who cares to let his box of paprika out of his own hand? While the ferryman was busy seasoning the fish with the red pepper, Oaken, writing about it, calls it poison, but that some wild tribes dare to eat it. The cowboy took the opportunity to drop his piece of peat, unobserved, into the fire. I say that paprikash must be singeing. What a smell it has, remarked the cobbler presently. Smell? Stink, I would call it, corrected the itinerant cloak vendor. 
but the heavy, greasy odor affected the noses of the cattle more markedly. First, the bull grew restless, snuffed in the air, shook the bell at his neck and lowed. Then lowering his head and lifting his tail, began to bellow dangerously. At that the cows got excited, capered to and fro, reared up on each other's backs, and jostled to the side of the ferryboat. Mother Mary, Holy Anna, protect the ship, shrieked the fat soap maker. Hurry up, mistress, seat yourself opposite. That will steady her again, joked the shoemaker. But it was no joke. Every man on board had to clutch the rope to keep the ferryboat from tilting over. The other side dipped nearly to the water. Suddenly the bull gave a bellow, and with one great bound, jumped into the river. Another moment, and every one of the four-and-twenty cows had followed him over the edge. The ferry was just about halfway across. Turn back! Turn back! screamed the Moravian drovers as the cattle swam straight towards the bank they had left. This is B.J. Harrison. I hope you've enjoyed this unabridged production of... The Yellow Rose, Part 2 of 3, by Morris Yokai. If you have enjoyed this book, please visit our website at classictalesaudiobooks.com and sign up to be a financial supporter. Donate $5 a month and get a monthly coupon code for $8 off any audiobook. You'll be glad you did. Thank you for joining me today and allowing classic literature to awaken your better self. Please join me every week, and we'll rediscover the greatest stories ever put to paper. <laughs>